All right, so let's continue our work to analyze the proof that uh, I found in this paper, a simple introduction to particle physics, the geometric foundations and relativity section. It's a really great paper, and we're going to go through, we're going to use this, we're already doing it, we started in the last lecture, to introduce the setup that this paper delivers. However, um, there's another paper out there that I found that basically has the same proof, uh, with a slightly different angle every now and then, but it is basically the same proof. Um, my instinct is that these guys actually uh, may have referred to one another. I don't know which paper was actually in what sequence. Uh, this says September 2016, but it's interesting. The archive is 2004. I don't know. I don't know any of these, these people myself, so I, I can't really comment. But they're both excellent papers. There's no doubt about that. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, the proof, though, from this paper, and every now and then I'll pop to this one. But I want everybody in the uh, the viewing audience to have access to both of these excellent um, papers that really get into this question of what is R and how to interpret R. All right, that's what we're sort of shooting for here. We're shooting for this interpretation of the uh, curvature scalar. All right, so let's uh, get back into, I'm going to, at the end of the last lecture, we talked a little bit about the setup. So we're going to review the setup and we're going to start uh, pushing forward. So you may remember that our goal was to take a manifold M, and this is an arbitrary manifold. It's not necessarily the manifold of general relativity, which is a four-dimensional manifold with a local Minkowski in metric, but um, uh, an arbitrary manifold and we are going to seek the area, and I'll put area in quotes, the area of a sphere that is one dimension less than the manifold that's embedded in the manifold. And we're going to uh, determine what that area is. And ultimately, we're going to discover that the area of this reduced dimensional sphere that's living inside this manifold is going to be different from the area you would expect if the manifold was an entirely flat space manifold. And that difference is ultimately going to be traceable to the existence of curvature, and it's going to be specifically measured by the curvature scalar. Now, if you just trusted me, we'd be done, because I would say, oh, the interpretation of R, this interpretation is simple. R ultimately tells you the the uh, amount of, of variation between the measured area of spheres that live in a curved space-time from the area you would expect from a flat space-time. But that's not good enough for my lectures. My lectures are, we're digging in and we're going to know exactly what the difference is, exactly how this makes that measurement, and prove it. And this proof is so deep, it just covers so much stuff that it's really great to do. So the setup is we have this manifold M and embedded in it is our, our sphere. The reason I put area in quotes is that M is our, our let's think of it as our space-time, right? M is our basic manifold, and it is a volume. We think of it, the metaphor is it's a three-dimensional volume, like something that fills space. Of course, it's a, in general relativity, it's a four-dimensional space-time. And filling space-time is kind of weird because you fill space and it occupies time. So, but that would be the volume. And then if you drew a sphere inside the volume of a four-dimensional space-time, the sphere would be three-dimensional. And, uh, but it's, it would, we would talk about if we're going to use the, the space-time itself as the base object of study, then it has volume, and things of one less dimensionality, ergo, have area. But of course, if we're dealing with a four-dimensional manifold, our area is actually three dimensions, which of course we would typically call a volume. So that's how the usage of the word area and volume are. Area is the volume of something that is in a space one dimension less than the space you're actually interested in. Right? So that's how all that works. So if we were going to go to our Marshall and Neal analysis, then the way that would look is the following. What we would do is Marshall is the 
uh, the, the, the sphere of interest, right? That's going to be what we were calling Marshall. I'm, I'm using the language we did from the previous two lectures about uh, pullbacks and push forwards because we are going to exercise those very things. So Marshall's actually a space uh, of one dimensionality less than Neil. And Neil's, the, the space of Neil is going to be the space of, of interest. So we're looking actually at a map that goes from the space of the sphere to the space of interest, which is the overall space. Now, that, this is how you would literally write it down based on the, uh, the analysis we did before, the presentation we did before about push forwards and pullbacks in the previous few lectures. The coordinate system on Marshall is theta, which is bold face, right? This is a bold face uh, theta in this paper. And we'll stick with that. I'm going to try to stick with this paper as best I can. And the function that goes from Marshall to Neil would we called you know we called those functions uh, before we called it I think uh, phi right. But in this case, that function is x. So x of theta is the function that has a domain of Marshall and a range of Neil. Theta, but however, we're dealing with coordinates, right? So theta is the coordinate system on Marshall, and x of theta gives you a coordinate in Neil, and ex that coordinate system in Neil is labeled x. So x is the coordinate system in Neil, and theta is the coordinate system in Marshall, and uh, the function, the, the transfer function, which is what we were calling it in the previous lecture, is x. Uh, alpha of theta, I'm going to use the A. Actually, it's not an, you know, I think he's, he, ultimately, I believe is he's going to distinguish between A and B. So I'm going to try to keep his notation. He's using not alpha, but just A. That's the Latin letter A. So uh, let me try to do that. Let me try to do that, do exactly what they're doing. I know I'm going to screw that up at some point in this. But the point is, is that this function has to return the dimensionality of Neil, which is one greater than the dimensionality of Marshall. Notice I drew Marshall smaller than Neil. This is going to be a one-to-one -one function, but it's not going to be surjective. It's not going to cover the entire space of Neil. In fact, what's really going on here is more of a picture like this. This is Neil, and this is Marshall, right? That's Marshall. And the, uh, uh, the function goes from the, the coordinate system of Marshall is now being converted to the equivalent coordinate of Neil. But remember, it's not a coordinate transformation. Right? This is why this stuff is confusing. This picture says, oh, Marshall is completely independent of Neil, but for this transfer function. But the way this is actually built is Marshall is a subset of Neil, a subset of one dimensionality less. And that subset is a manifold in its own right and has its own coordinate system, and yet it lives in Neil. So obviously, every point in Marshall has some coordinate in Neil. Neil has a good coordinate system, x alpha, right? And I'm kind of assuming everything's on a single chart here. Let's not worry too much about overlapping charts, per se, but there's no pro there shouldn't be any problem of taking every point in Marshall and coming up with a coordinate in Neil, especially now that you know that Marshall's a subset of Neil, but Marshall can never be a chart on Neil because the ch every chart of Neil has to have the dimensionality of Neil. Marshall's very different. It's got one dimension less, right? The dimensionality of, of, N, of this is N, and the dimensionality of this, of course, is N minus 1. So I, I emphasize this. This is not a coordinate transformation, but it really looks like it, right? Because you have the coordinates x are a function of the coordinates theta. How many times have I said the new coordinates are a function of the old coordinates, or the old coordinates are a function of the new coordinates, depending on which way you were going? And that's what it looks like. This is a coordinate function, and that's a, a, a coordinate. So this seems like a coordinate transformation, but it isn't. It is not. It is a transfer function. Between, I'm calling it a transfer function. That's not standard language, by the way. That's I'm looking for some word for this function, so I'm calling it a transfer function. It, but uh, it, it's a transfer function from one, it's a mapping. It's a mapping from Marshall to Neil is what it is. Okay, 
So I think I've beat that horse to death. But um, uh, so the collection of all points x uh, uh, x of theta for all theta is the set of all points of s minus one, right? So that's this is basically saying all the points of Marshall in, where the surface of Marshall is interpreted as a point inside Neil, and that's of course exactly what this function delivers. And there's, there's A of them, which means there's N of them, not A. There's N different transfer functions. Uh, each of the individual coordinate axes of Neil uh, has its own function, and those functions are labeled with the A, and there's N of them. So there's N of these functions. Despite the fact that you're going from, you know, obviously you're going from an N minus one uh, dimension to an N dimension, you're going to need n of these to do it. Okay, so uh, we've decided about that, and then um, we talked about this last time. So working from an element of our underlying manifold, we want to find the metric at all points um, p plus lambda in all possible directions. So what are they saying there? Oh, first they said gij tilde is the metric on s minus 1, and... Um, we assume we have a metric G A B on M. Okay, so that's pretty important. Let's uh, let's work that up. All right, so the basic setup, S N minus one, M, the dimensionality of M is N, the dimensionality of this is obviously N minus one. The metric on this is given by the by uh, G tilde I J. So the tilde is probably gonna be the clue, but also this metric is a function of the coordinates on this manifold. That, those coordinates are theta. So when I write theta, I'm always going to be thinking theta, uh, theta 0, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3, etc., all the way to theta um, n minus 2, right? If you start at 0, I guess you end up at n minus 2. I've had that confusion before. So if I just have theta with no scripting on it, remember, it's all of these. It's each of the coordinates, right? Uh, likewise, over here, if I write x, you know, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, x0 all the way to x n minus 1, right? So that's what, that's what these mean when there's no superscript or subscript. Um, in the print, of course, they're bold face, right? This, that's why this, uh, I'm drawing this little bold face. So you would normally get a bold face, but I'm probably not going to struggle with bold face for, throughout this thing. So G, uh, and now G is our metric on the manifold M. So you got to think of the manifold M. This is our space-time that we know the answer to. We're asked, we're, we want to know something about the curvature of the space-time. If we know the metric, in principle, you know everything, right? Because remember, the, I, I'll just say it again, right? The metric gives us the most important geometrical concept in all of differential geometry, the connection, right? And the connection gives us the curvature tensor, and the curvature tensor gives us the Ricci tensor, and the Ricci tensor gives us the scalar. And this is kind of what we're studying now. We've gone all the way through this, right? We're at the very end of this chain. Okay, so we are assuming that we know the metric on M. We've solved the Einstein equation. We're really, really smart about M. And we're now trying to understand inside M lies this little, this subset, this subset, which is uh, S n minus 1, which I've drawn here outside, but it's actually embedded, right? So we, we understand that. But living inside here is this thing S n minus 1. So now, to understand how to do all the work we want to do, we need to remind ourselves exactly how S n minus 1 was constructed, and I'll walk that through that really quickly, uh, repeating stuff that I've said in the past three or four lectures, right? But S minus 1 is embedded. We have to say, what points of M are we calling this? What points? What makes those special? So let's uh, make sure we understand that. All right, so this is how we're going to apply this. X is the transfer function. So we're looking for the pullback of X of a one form, and we'll just use a basis one form, dxa, right? So that's the pullback from m. This is the pullback from m of a, a simple one form, which is a 0, 1 tensor, right? Um, that pullback is what we want to know. We want to know this for each basis vector, but we figured this out. We have a coordinate system. 
on m, which is x, and we have a coordinate system on sn minus 1, which is theta, right? And we have did that. We did this in our like a lecture and a half ago or something. And we know the formula. The formula is this partial derivative, the partial derivative of the uh, components of the transfer function with respect to the relative components of the new coordinate system in Sn minus 1, all multiplied by the 1 form in Sn minus 1. This is the pullback of that vector. Now, likewise, I can do this for a different exponent. I can just change a to b, right? Here's, uh, here, here's the thing. I, I literally rewrite this in terms of b, come on, I erase the a, and I do this in terms of b, and then uh, I speculate, okay, what is, what is the push forward of dx a tensor product dx b, right? And these are, these are meant to be Roman letters. So I want the push forward of this thing, so I could write x push forward, that's a push forward operator, on this, but the push forward on this tensor product, as we learned in a previous lecture, is the push forward of this tensor product with the push forward of that. So it's this guy tensor product with that guy, which means it's this guy tensor product with this guy. So what I actually should do in preparation for this is change the i to a j, right? I'm going to need to do that. I'm going to need to change the i to a j, so I'm going to change this to a j. Remember, this is a dummy variable, so it doesn't matter at all. Um, and now uh, I write down that the push forward of this basis vector of the 0, 2 tensor product space, that is going to be, uh, because of linearity, you end up with this, uh, uh, this relationship right here. Right? So the push forward of this 0, 2 tensor is simply this. And these you can calculate. We know this because, remember, we know x a of theta, right? That is the transfer function, right? Where this don't make no mistake. This is not hard. This is the derivative of a presumably known transfer function. And so uh, now we know um, how to take uh, any basis vector in the zero two tensor product space of m and get a the pullback of that in s n minus one. And now to apply that to uh, the uh, to apply this to the metric tensor, it's not so hard. I just, let me just set it up, right? That's going to be, the metric tensor over here is going to be G A B, right? That's the metric tensor. The metric tensor is just a 0, 2 tensor, so it's written in that basis. So here it is, written in the basis, and we're interested in the X push forward of that, right? Well, it's, everything's linear, right? Everything's linear. So all I have to do here is, let's see if I can squeeze this all in. Uh, how am I going to squeeze this in? Hmm. Hold on. I'm going to select the basis vector. I'll shrink it up and move it over a little bit. And then I just put in G, A, B, right? And now these guys are all a summed over, right? So for any i, j component, these guys are summed out. So there's only going to be i and j. The, the dimensionality is going to be s n minus 1 of each of these pieces. So uh, It's going to be n minus 1 of each of these pieces. So because the a and the b, which sum over n, will sum out. And then you'll be left with um, uh, the appropriate number of dimensions, is my point. But this now, this is a full expression, including the basis vector, of the metric the metrics pull back from m to sn minus 1. So this guy here is what we are now defining as g tilde ij, ij, d tilde ij, and that is a function of theta. That is a function of theta. You might ask, okay, wait a minute, why is it a function of theta? And you know, look, I'm really digging into this, right? I'm repeating myself many times. That's all part of my shtick. But why is this a function of theta? How do we know? This should be kind of elementary in a principle, but I don't, I don't think it is elementary. I think it's easy to lose track of the easiest things, right? But what's going on over here? Well, here, GAB is a function of X, 
right? dx a tensor product dx b. So what I'm what am I doing? Well, I'm taking that entire field and pulling it back. The um, this guy here in principle, right? Uh, undo this is a function our function of x right there, right? That's actually a function of x. GAB is a function of x no matter how you look at it. So these guys, however, are functions of theta, right? Because x a is a function of theta 0, dot, 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 to theta n minus 2. So those derivatives are functions of theta. So this is already uh, a function of theta. So, uh, so each now, but then we do it point by point, right? Uh, I have to pick a point x over here in order to find the value of this thing with respect to theta. I'm I'm pulling back this thing at each point. Now, uh, uh, so I end up with these values at a certain point. So this gets evaluated at a certain point. Uh, these guys are now left as functions of theta, and ultimately the only thing left is a function of theta. Right, you're 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 pulling back the field, but uh, you you have to evaluate it at each point in X. Wait, 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 wait. wait. That that's not a good way to say it. the 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 way to say it is, G A B is a function of X, but X is a function of theta. So G A B can always be made into a function of theta via the transfer function, right? So in the end, this is always a function of theta. You're basically restricting the values of x to, to theta. So that, that's how that works. But the point is, is you've now calculated the metric of the space s n minus 1. You've calculated that directly knowing the metric of the space m. And this is the calculation. Now, I'm going to cut it back. I'm going to take off the basis vectors because the basis vectors are usually ignored in these kinds of calculations. We're always worried about the components. Um, so we end up with, what, what, what components do we end up with? Well, we end up with i, j. That's exactly those two components down there. These are dummy indices that, that go away. All right, so that, this is the key formula we've got to think about. All right, so let's see where we're at. So we've normalized all the tangent vectors to 1. And we take every possible normalized tangent vector. So we take this one here, and we take this one here, and all of the others, and all the possible geodesics. And once we've done that, we crawl out along the geodesic a distance lambda, a distance lambda. So say this point here is a distance lambda along that geodesic. And likewise, we'll say this point here is a distance lambda along this geodesic. And then, presumably, likewise, a point here is the distance lambda along this GDZ, right? And we just keep doing this for all, all the lambdas or all the GDZ that are around the point P. And, of course, we're going to kind of build up a whole bunch of points that are a distance lambda, a GDZ distance a lambda away. Now, why do we do this? We do this because in curved space, geodesics means straight lines. A straight line in a curved space is a geodesic. And we're trying to build, we're trying to build this thing called Sn minus 1, which is a sphere. What's the definition of a sphere? Definition of a sphere is the locus of points that are all a distance, a, a, the same distance away from a given point. Well, that's what we've done. So here's the given point P. We're moving a distance lambda in every direction, and we take the locus of all of those points. There, we have cleaned it up a little bit. Now, the way the, the paper writes this is they call all of these points, they call it P plus lambda, which is a little awkward and very, very informal because when they write P plus lambda, they mean this process. The point P, and then you go out in a direction lambda. The point P is abstract, so it doesn't even have coordinates. This addition isn't defined. Lambda is not something you can ever add to anything. Because lambda represents um, the length of, of, uh, of a segment of a geodesic line, right? You don't add lambdas together. 
Um, so, so what, you know, in some sense, what you might want to say is, okay, the coordinate mu of the point P, right, plus the change in coordinates uh, that are associated with this uh, movement of lambda. I suppose you could come up with something like that as a legitimate notation. So the notation is actually very, very, very informal. So when you see this here, uh, where do I, where was the last? When you see this, um, all points P plus lambda along, what they're just basing is they're trying to say all points displaced lambda by a distance of lambda along all possible geodesics through P in all directions, okay? So when you do that, when you do that and you form the locus of those points, that would be you, you know, you, you do this, inf you, forming a locus is essentially saying, you know, you do it everywhere, right? You do every possible um, geodesic, right? And, and, and every geodesic is defined by these unit vectors in the middle. And you end up with something that looks like this. Now, this is, imagine that M is a three-dimensional space. Well, then you've got to come out of the board too, right? So you end up, you know, with an object that's, spherical let me see if i can make this thing look a little spherical i guess you know it would go into the page right and so you would end up with this space that's two-dimensional right this guy would be a two-dimensional surface inside m and that would be called s n minus one and that's how you choose s n minus one that is how we get to uh what what, what we want to get to which is uh um well, that's how we get to our uh, our sphere, or our our, sli our slightly smaller sphere, right? So this guy is our construction. So let's uh, uh, catch it back up. Let, I mean, let's. Uh, 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 well, I'll just do the summary right here. So what we were drawing is S n minus one m, and now we need this mapping from S minus n minus one to m. Well, once we've defined this object. It's a sphere, right? So a sphere is a manifold, so a manifold has a coordinate system. So we're going to give that coordinate system uh, uh, a name, and we're going to call that coordinate system theta. And uh, the coordinate system on M, we're going to give a name, and that's x mu. And then the functions that get us from one to the other will be x mu of theta. All right, so now we can look at our setup again. So I've kind of redrawn everything. Here's M, right? M has our point P in it. We created this uh, manifold S n minus one using this technique we talked about a moment ago as displayed here. And we're gonna presume that there's, uh, so the point P lives in M, there's some function F that lives on M. And back here in uh, uh, S n minus one, uh, I don't think I need a point in S n minus one quite yet. So that's our basic setup. Now the transfer functions, the, the idea is that the coordinates on m are named x, and the coordinates on s are named theta. So we're going to call it the transfer function x of theta, and I would remind you, don't confuse that as a uh, coordinate transformation, right? Remember the old coordinate transformation where you would have something like x, i, prime, the new coordinates as a function of the old coordinates, and the old coordinates as a function of the new coordinates, something like that. There's core, the, the functions are named, the, trans, the, the transformation functions are named after the functions, after the coordinates themselves, and the arguments are coordinates. And it kind of looks like that here. You know, the, 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 these, this transfer function is named after the same as a coordinate, and its argument is coordinates. And to make matters worse, this is shorthand for, for um, x, uh, let me draw a little better x, sorry. This is shorthand for x, mu theta i, right? Because there's n of these formulas, one for each coordinate in, in m, right? And so th this literally looks the same as a coordinate transformation, but it isn't. It's taking coordinates from a manifold, because a coordinate transformation would take coordinates from, the same man from a manifold to the same manifold. That's what a coordinate transformation would do. It would, it would look like, like this, right? It would be x alpha, or the new coordinates might be like x hat alpha instead of a prime, like I used, my favorite is the prime, um, but uh, to x beta, right? That's what a coordinate transformation would be. This is different because the domain of this guy, 
the domain of this is not the same manifold as M. Although to further confuse matters, the domain of this is actually a manifold that is a subset of M, right? But we're sort of, we need to abstractify it and think of it as two separate manifolds for the time being. But the fact that this is embedded in M means that this is not a hard function to understand because clearly all the points here do have coordinates, uh, uh, X coordinates. It's just there's, there's one degree of freedom removed because it's constrained to a, a surface of one less dimension. Okay, let me clean this back up. Hold on. All right, so with that set up, then we should have a quick look at our push forwards and pull backs that are now available because we have the situation manifold um, mapping to another manifold. So we should have all these push forwards and pullbacks. So using the notation we used before, where the, the transfer function was given by a function phi, so this would be phi of theta would land in, would still output coordinates in M, right? But our old notation, when we did the lesson on push forwards and pullbacks, we use phi. So there we use phi Phi star, well, I guess I, I'm going to, I'm trying to do stars, right? Phi star would be, um, uh, let's see, how would that work? Phi stars would be pull backs and phi stars with the subscript would be push forwards, right? So let's rewrite those formulas in terms of our current uh, notation. And that's what I think I've done here, right? Uh, a function f, a function f on the original manifold uh, its pullback is this composition expression, a vector that lives at the point S in this manifold can be pushed forward, right? And when that push forward vector it operates on a function, you should get the same expression as the original vector operating on the pullback. So see how we use this to bootstrap the definition of this. Um, and uh, so now, uh, so now this guy's doing like a triple duty. It's representing the the coordinates on M. So that's what that's what the X's are. It's naming the transfer function, and now it's being that transfer function is being used to identify push forwards and pullbacks. And then uh, let's see, you can pull back a form field alpha that lives here, right? And that pullback of the form field alpha acting on a vector at P. Uh, hold on, something seems wrong here. Um, the the vector the form field lives over here, so the form field alpha lives there. P is a point in M, right? So 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 this idea of chi p is confusing because I've established that p is in M, so p needs to be a point over here. So let me change this to S, right? This should be an S. I think I had this right the first time. I think I changed it and changed it back. So I'm going to make this uh, an S, an S, and an S. Or So you start with a field here in M. You pull it back here, right? That's what this is. Then you evaluate it at S. And then you operate on a tangent vector located at S, right? And that should be a real number because it's a form field operating on a vector. So this is a real number. Well, that should be the original form field over here operating at uh, x of s, right? So now I'm using the transfer function. Its argument is the name of a point, right? Right, so that's a, yet another way of using this transfer function. If I say this point s lives here, I just throw that s in the argument run it through the transfer function, and the output of this better be coordinates in M. Somewhere in M is the point, is the point X of S. So this is a, so I guess technically speaking, what you're saying is since X is really takes arguments of coordinates, I need the coordinate function of the point S like this, right? So now S is doing three things. It takes X, takes points in Sn minus 1 as an argument, and it outputs, uh, no, 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 no. S is in N minus 1, so it would be theta of S, right? Right, so yeah, so it doesn't do three things. It just does two things. Okay, uh, well, theta is now doing a couple things. So these are actually, you can think of these as not just coordinates on Sn minus 1, but also coordinate functions. 
and coordinate functions take points, right, and return coordinates, right? So you think of them as the coordinates and also as coordinate functions that take, so this represents the coordinates of the point S, right? So that's what, um, uh, so, so now, but I'm still using this as the transfer function of the point S, but it's really got to be, if you're going to be real strict about it, it's got to be the transfer function of the coordinates of the point X. Because if I'm defining the transfer function with a domain of coordinates and a range of coordinates, well, then I need this guy to be a domain. But this is a shorthand for that is just this, right? That's shorthand, right? And, and that's, look, this stuff is serious because you read these papers and the shorthand just gets out of control sometimes. And uh, I, I just think it's totally worth doing. For example, what was that, what was that shorthand we looked at over here, right? This thing, right? Remember this P plus lambda shorthand? That's crazy. Uh, I mean, it's totally logical. I, I'm not, I'm not blasting the authors. I mean, there's, they're assuming that you're, uh, well, uh, intelligent, not intelligent. They're, of course, everybody's intelligent. They're assuming that you're well-trained enough to know how to follow this kind of logic. They can't rewrite a general relativity textbook for every single paper they do to make sure everybody understands everything exactly the same way. Um, and uh, a fair criticism of my work is that I constantly keep redoing this stuff. But that's just my, my shtick is to repeat and repeat and repeat. Anyway, um, okay, so uh, where, are, where were we? So we've, these now are how we make our pull, push forwards and pullbacks. The one we care about is this one right here, right? We need to understand this one because that's the one we're going to use. And uh, the last thing we did was we, uh, we showed how this definition of the pullback and also this definition of the push forward were expressed in pure coordinate form. And we have a coordinate system, right? We have theta. We have x, so we should be able to analyze this in coordinate form. And the thing we need to know is that the uh, pullback of a one-form field, right? And notice, so now the one-form field is dx alpha. So here's the coordinate system m, right? The coordinate system m, undo, undo. Uh, um, and uh, the coordinate system on m is, is x, so the coordinate basis for the cotangent space is written dx alpha. That's the coordinate basis. The coordinate basis for the uh, tangent spaces would be written partial by partial x alpha, which is a longhand for partial alpha. That's the assumption. You lose the x here, but you assume the x is the coordinates, right? Because it's the coordinate basis. So we want to know what is the... So this is a form field, right? It's, the, it's a form field defined by, you know, a regular form field would be A alpha dx alpha. Well, if all the A alphas are zero except for w w one particular one, say A zero, then that would equal um, A zero dx zero, right? So if we're going to be speaking in terms of uh, being very general, we just talk about A alpha dx alpha. That's an arbitrary one-form field. But if all the A alphas are zero except for one, then uh, you're just dealing with the one-form field of, say, dx zero or dx one. Anyway, that's what we kind of mean by this. We mean uh, a one-form field uh, with just one. But this is the unit vector, the unit vector or the unit covector of a one-form field. Anyway, the pullback of that thing in a system when you have coordinates is just the partial derivative of the transfer function with respect to each of the coordinates in uh, Sn minus 1 times the uh, multiplied by the basis vectors of the one-form fields in Sn minus 1. So this is pretty simple because this we know because we know this function. So we certainly can take its derivative, right? I guess I should make go ahead and be explicit here now with the alphas and the i's to match our expression down here. Likewise, the push forward of a vector is given, um, you know, it's funny, this thing is the same in both equations, but this guy is different and the ultimate result is different. So anyway, so that's the setup that we're going to, uh, to need. And we're gonna really lean on this, or yeah, th uh, this expression right here because we're about to go to the next page. 
All right, so the next page of the paper says, and we can therefore use the pullback from this, which is the transfer function. Oh, they're using A. I keep using alpha or, or mu. All right, but whatever. Uh, we can, there, so I, I, I want to make sure I'm consistent, so I'm going to start using my subscript A there. But we can use the pullback from this transfer find, function to find the induced metric G tilde IJ on SN minus 1. So that's obviously their plan, right? The plan is, you have these transfer functions, which they are writing as uh, x a theta i, right? Those are the transfer functions. I say functions plural, right? It's it's kind of an argument, you know. It's, there's one function for each coordinate, right? And but we think of it as a single function because it takes points over here, the coordinates of a point over here, and gives you the coordinates of a point over here. So there's this sort of mixture of plural and singular. This is thought of as one object, but it's really four, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, it's four in the same way that this is looks like one thing, but it's actually n minus one things, right? There's n minus one of these, and there's n of these. When I say four, I mean n, right? Four in general relativity, n uh, in the manifold. But using this transfer function, we're going to take what we know over here to be the metric, which I think they're writing as g i j, which is a function of uh, the coordinates over here. And we want what they're calling g tilde i j, which is a function of theta over here. So we want to take this metric and pull it back. And we're going to use, whoops, we're going to use this stuff right here to do it. Right? Now, the difference between pulling back the metric and pulling back alpha is that the metric is not a one form. It is a zero two, um, a zero two tensor, right? And a one form, when I say one form, I'm meaning a one, zero one tensor right now. A zero one tensor is also a one form, but it's such an elementary form that it's really just equivalent to a zero one tensor. A two form is actually an anti-symmetric zero two tensor, but we're, we can pull back. If you can pull back one forms, you can pull back two forms by linearity. And that formula, uh, let me write that formula down. So if we're going to do it for, if we're going to do a pull back for the metric tensor on M. This guy is a metric tensor on M, and you can tell because its coordinates it takes is X. And this is defined on all of M, right? And here's the little basis vectors that are tensor product. This is what makes it a zero to tensor, right? Which is matched by the subscripts and the superscripts here, right? This is all our very classic, what is a tensor uh, knowledge, right? So we're gonna pull this guy back. Well, everything's linear in this story, so you use this formula, uh, well, use this formula right here on each of the basis vectors on the left-hand side. That's what this is. And you just pull it in. Uh, it just commutes right through everything. And you act on this one and act on that one separately. So you end up with two different component factors, one here like this. And you're left with basis vectors in Sn minus 1. And then you just contract, right? And when you contract, the ultimately, you get rid of the basis vectors and you just work with the components and you end up with this expression. Almost every paper in the world will just work with the components, so you've got to get used to it. So there it is, the components. Uh, actually, I should, to be honest, you've got to get used to the way I do it, where I drag around the basis vectors, because everybody else does it this way. Um, but anyway, the point is, here we are, uh, the pullback of the metric is this product, right? The product of these partial derivatives, uh, Einstein summed into the metric on M, and that gives you the answer, which is what they're calling the metric IJ uh, tilde, which is on SN minus one. Now you might be wondering, well, how does this end up being uh, a function of theta? Because if you look at it, this is clearly a function of theta, and this is clearly a function of theta, right? Because uh, if it isn't obvious, x a is a function of theta, right? So the partial derivative of x with respect to some one of these variables theta uh, is going to be a function of theta. So these are functions of theta explicitly. This guy's a function of x, right? But 
you can't just plug in any x here. You can only, by construction, you can only plug in the x's in M that uh, exist over here because this transfer function doesn't have an inverse for every uh, point on M. It only has an inverse for the points that are on SN minus one, right? So, but, it, but for those points, it does in fact have an inverse, right? So the X's that end up going in here can be inverted to give you theta. So I'll, I'll be very careful to write the argument of this to be um, X A inverse, right? But with the idea that this is not invertible, it's not an invertible function. You you can only invert it for those appropriate things. It doesn't even mean anything for uh, the ones that are not uh, uh, appropriate for the inversion. But regardless, let me focus your attention on this expression right here. This expression right here. If I filled in the arguments, right? I have to fill in the arguments. This is uh, at a point uh, theta, and this is a, it's an argu This has arguments of theta, so I'll fill that in. And um, uh, this x here, like we'll just talk about, is only legitimate for those key points. Well, what what's a good way of expressing that? Well, a good way of expressing that is p plus lambda. Right. Understanding this language that the paper seemed weird a moment ago now is actually very useful because it captures this idea of partial inverse that I was kind of talking around in circles, right? But if I put in this p plus lambda, but you understand that that's not a real sum, that reflects this process and captures only those points on the sphere, right? That's the idea. It's very informal, but it it works brilliantly right here, which is exactly, of course, why the authors chose to do it. Um, these thetas, too, by the fact that they're thetas, definitely mean that this is a coordinate somewhere on this sphere. But I want it to reflect, you know, this has all got to be done at the same point. So if I'm going to put a p plus lambda here, and that refers to some point in s minus 1, I need to put the same p plus lambda in there, too. And voila, this thing is really the answer. And notice how we're actually showing the power of the informal statement of p plus lambda. It's We're all referring to the same point, right? Some point on this sphere, oops, on this sphere, uh, Sn minus 1, you pick that point. That every point here is essentially p plus lambda, right? So we pick one of them. And that one we pick is the one we're talking about in this expression. And so if we go back to the paper, we ultimately see that that's what this is all about, right? That's what this is all about. Oh, I guess my far left-hand side, I didn't include that, right? So let's, let's do that. Let's make it totally explicit that this represents G hat, uh, I guess what's left over is I, J at P plus lambda. Right? Now, this will ex be explicitly put in terms of theta here. Here, you have to put p plus lambda in in terms of x because this is a function of x. Right, That was that whole little inversion argument. You can make it a function of theta, but only for those points that are actually invertible. Um, and then, uh, uh, of course, these p plus lambdas here and the partial derivatives are the same as this one here, and they're given in terms of theta. So that's what this equation right here is, right? This is saying that if I take the metric on M, right? This is the metric on M, and I go through this process, I end up with the metric on Sn minus 1. And this is going to be in terms of, this is going to cover the entire uh the entire uh, space Sn minus 1. So that's in terms of theta. This only, this only covers the p plus lambda parts of M. But this is the expression that's going to drive the entire paper, is calculating, well, the core of the paper, is calculating what is the induced metric. They call that the induced metric. And it's induced because we know the metric on M. We know this thing. And since Sn minus 1 lives in M, certainly it's got a metric, and that metric is this guy. 
And that guy must be entirely dependent on this, right? It's the, it's the, it's the metric that's induced from one manifold to the other, and it's induced by these transfer functions, A, theta, I, right? So now the rest of the paper is to try to figure that out, try to do this calculation. I shouldn't say the rest of the paper, a lot of the paper. And the problem that they're emphasizing in the next line of their work is that they, they write down, uh, we, have to be, we must be careful because we want to define everything in terms of what we know at P, which will demand some work because P is not even in S n minus 1. So, of course, what they're saying is, you know, the manifold M has a point P in it, and then the manifold Sn minus 1 is, is embedded in M, and it's around P, right? But we want to take all of the mathematical objects that are involved in this problem, and just knowing their values only at P, only at P, we want to solve this problem just using those values. So the presumption is that, well, we know the metric... GAB at P, and of course from that we know the connection alpha, beta, gamma at P, and then we'll assume that we know, say, the Riemann tensor alpha, beta, gamma, delta also at the point P. And from this, and from our understanding, uh, and from these numbers here, these are the only numbers we're allowed to use to evaluate the right-hand side of this expression. So to get this metric over here, we're only allowed to use uh, these numbers all calculated at P, and that's very difficult. But of course, whenever you see that, you know immediately what's going to happen. It's Taylor, it's Taylor span expansion. Uh, it's a tour de force of Taylor expansion. So that's what we will begin in the next lesson.